Topic for this last talk here is standardizing the industry protocols and standards to overcome variable conditions. I'm a welcome Sarah Chatterjee, Director of Electrification Strategies and Programs at the Electric Power Engineers LLC to welcome our speakers to the stage, Sarah. Good afternoon, and congratulations. You've made it to the final session of the EV Charging Summit. Who here has had an amazing time at the conference? Who here has heard some creative and innovative thoughts, ideas, concepts? Who here has talked too much and is losing their voice? <laughs> well, thank you for the introduction and welcome to this very, very important topic on standardizing our industry. We're here to talk about standards and protocols for how to address the variable changes within the EV market. As Alex said, I'm Sarah Chatterjee. I'm the Director of Electrification Strategies and Programs for Electric Power Engineers. We're an engineering consulting firm with power systems engineers focused on renewable energy, distributed energy resources, and electrification. Uh, with me here today, I have a powerhouse set of experts on this panel to talk about very unique and diverse aspects of protocols and standards. I'm gonna ask my panelists to spend maybe about one to two minutes introducing yourself, talk a little bit about your, your company and your background and experience or role as it relates to protocols and standards. And I'm gonna start with Dr. Silky. Good afternoon, everybody. A very warm welcome from my side also to our panel. My name is Dr. Silke Kirchner. I am with and representing Webasto Charging Systems based in Monrovia, California. And Webasto is a top tier one supplier that has been supplying cutting edge products to the automotive market since 120 years. And today it is our mission to utilize our automotive DNA and help drive the net zero emissions transition by 2050. As such, we offer complete e-mobility solutions ranging from battery systems to charging systems on the hardware side as well as software side. Our solutions are designed and tailored for specific use cases, B2C, but also in fleet applications, real estate, or uh, customized to your specific need. Uh, myself, I am a digital product manager, and uh, for me, this panel is in intriguingly uh, interesting because we are looking to drive a friendly experience in regards to EV infrastructure, which I believe um, the solution to this challenge is a landscape of open and standardized proto communication protocols. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Silky. Next, can we have Hillary? Hi, everyone. I'm Hillary Taylor. I'm the Director of Engineering at Spark Charge. I've been with the company for three years and been a part of the EV charging industry for nearly 10 now. Um, so at Spark Charge, we are the innovator of the world's first mobile and powerful DC fast charging system for electric vehicles. And not only are we the innovator of the hardware, but we operationalize it to, and have launched the world's first on-demand charging service for electric vehicles. So in doing so, we alleviate a lot of EV drivers of some of the pain points associated with the installation and maintenance that sometimes comes along with fixed infrastructure and then maintaining that infrastructure. So as the pioneer of mobile DC fast charging, we see ourselves as a key stakeholder though in the standards and pro open protocol community, not just a technology operating adjacent to it. So, <laughs> so the goal for us and for me as the head of engineering at Spark Charge is to help facilitate uniformity and consistency across different charging technologies and different uh, charging services, including mobile charging as a service. <laughs> so, the end goal for me is to make EV drivers feel like they have multiple charging options at their disposal and make them feel more comfortable uh, buying that EV. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Hillary. 
and we'll turn over to Chris. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Chris King. I'm responsible for strategic partnerships and strategic initiatives for the Siemens e-mobility business. I'd like to call this my fourth startup, uh, a serial entrepreneur. I came to Siemens through an acquisition uh, when Siemens bought my software company several years back and have been in this standard space going back to uh, even before smart meters. So uh, a couple of decades now, a little bit more than that. Um, our e-mobility business is very much an open ecosystem. We have a strong belief in open standards and interoperability. Been heavily involved in interoperability, in e-mobility, going back really uh, six, seven years now on the standards in the e-mobility space. And uh, I, I want to uh, recognize all of you for being here on the, at the last session on the last day. Um, we all know this is the most exciting topic, even though it probably has the most boring name. Thank you, Chris. All right, well, we're going to start with the first question, and I'll, I'll ask the question. Feel free to, to jump in. Anyone can take um, a stab at the question. Um, you, you spoke about open standards, and that's really important. You know, in what way does open standards enhance the customer experience, and, and, and how important are open standards for that customer experience with the role of electric vehicles and the electric vehicle industry? Yes, yep. To me, it all boils down to interoperability. So I think interoperability on a consumer-facing side is what's driving a good and friendly user experience. That means like a one matches all mobile app or the seamless integration of your charger in your home energy management system. And that is all supported by back-end systems interoperability. That means by standardized communication between chargers to the respective central management system between backends, between utilities and cross-functional um, to DSOs. Um, and so to me, it all boils down to interoperability. And I think open standards drive exactly that aspect of interoperability on the backend side that is then leading to a friendly driver experience also within the context of our modern energy ecosystem. Let me start with your second part of your question, which is how important it is. And I will bring Tesla into the picture here uh, in two ways. Um, in one way, because they have done an amazing job. In another way, because they have really hurt the industry and made it difficult. Um, the importance is when you look at a Tesla driver, everything talks to everything else. The charger talks to the vehicle, the vehicle talks to the person. The vehicle talks to the bank. When you charge with a Tesla charger, you pull up to the charger, you plug it in, and you go do whatever your business is, and it just ends up on your Tesla bill at the end of the month. And that's because they have protocols that work together between all the different elements of their system. Um, so the disservice that they've done is those are all proprietary, and nobody else can use them although their connector, they've uh, supposedly opened that one up um, because that's another piece of it, right? The connector has to talk to the vehicle and even that has problems. So anyway, that is the, that is the experience we all want to have. We want to be able to come up, plug in, walk away. Everything talks to everything else in the background and we don't have to worry about it. And we're, that's what we're working toward and uh, as an industry, we'll get there. Um, and uh, the, the NEVI standards uh, will take us a long way toward that. But uh, that's uh, for the consumer, it's all about that experience. And also, maybe one aspect to interoperability might be that you're also able you know, to mix and match. So you have like a very um, large um, offer of EV infrastructure uh, components, systems, and if you make the interfaces interoperable, right, so you're vendor agnostic, you can mix and match as a charge point operator, you might be able to take over charging stations from someone else's network. So I think this fair market competition that also comes with interoperability, well, help drive exactly that aspect that we can also, you know, um, streamline to that 
Tesla experience um, as together as an industry? Absolutely, and I think you, you've all touched on a couple different parts, right? When we talk about standards, we talk about protocols, there's different aspects of that. There is you know, the customer and what the customer is facing, what the customer is seeing. And most of the time, the customer is not going to have that detailed technical understanding or knowledge or differentiation between the different components and parts of the ecosystem, right? So you have the port. And understanding the port, you have the different physical charging station itself, the supply equipment. You have the, the charge management system, which they may or may not know anything about, the different applications that they have to use. They have the charge point operator network solution. And the ecosystem goes all the way up through to utility integration. Uh, Hillary, yesterday we were talking and you, you brought up some of the testing that you've been involved with, with regards to these standards and protocols, and even though you have a number of different manufacturers that are compliant with these uh, protocols, still you see variability. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. So in, in the ecosystem, we have annual test events, and a test event is a multi-day event where we stand with our charger, with the cars in the center, in a circle, in round robin fashion, and we're allocated a couple hours per vehicle to, to perform different aspects of charge testing. And what you'll find is, although we all say we're compliant, both EV, SE, and EV, there's a lot of debugging that goes on within those two hours. So it turns out everyone has their own flavor of implementation um, because the standard um, is at the discretion or interpretation of the engineer or whoever is implementing it. So it's just an interesting aspect of the standard. The, the result though is a very manual, kind of painstaking process. So even though there's a lot of language around these things, it's not perfect yet. And I think it would be interesting to delve deeper into why exactly there is and then as electric vehicle scale, right? There's, there's a limited number of models now, but what happens at, when we get to 2030 and it's nothing but? That, that's not a sustainable way to, to keep at it. So what can we do um, in this community to, to optimize and make this more efficient? Absolutely. I couldn't agree more on this topic. Also, when we test our devices against ISO 1511.8, or um, OCPP 1.6201, we also find that flavor. So it's not a perfect match uh, ad hoc, right? It is tuning required. And we also exactly um, are facing that challenge that there's still room for interpretation and uh, how can standards maybe be more strict about it or be more clear about certain aspects so you don't have that room of interpretation. Yeah, and, uh, and what's happening now is uh, this, uh, California anyway, there is a requirement for certification testing by a third party lab. So that will certainly help in terms of harmonizing the implementation of the standard. Absolutely, all, all great insights and input. Um, Dr. Silke, you, you talked a little bit about ISO 15118. And, and so just to delve a little bit more into how do open standards support the growing energy demand and the decentralization of power generation. Exactly. So that's all in the spirit of the net zero emissions transition by 2050. So we really observe like own households, own businesses generating their own energy through photovoltaics, through uh, wind turbines, using electrical energy storage units. And there is really a lot of harmonization effort to be done for all these diverse systems to communicate efficiently and effectively uh, together so you have a really stable DUR grid. And our mission is to see our chargers part of this modern ecosystem. So um, we, uh, we drive for ISO 1511-8 um, vehicle to grid as part of the uh, ecosystem and then uh, combine OCPP, for example, with open ADR to make a charging station smart and flexible. That means uh, the charging station can react on changes in demand response and um, on local or currently available capacity provision. So um, that is a very important topic because we totally see um, 
EVs as assets, right, for the future, not as threats, because these are huge mobile electrical energy storage units that can be uh, utilized, as we talked yesterday, also if you look at school buses or uh, applications where we really have the possibility to supply renewable energy back to the grid. Um, and that's really something very interesting and where standards and open communication protocols help drive, also streamline this very diverse field of so many, so many um, stakeholders, so many players involved. And I think uh, open standards are very crucial to drive that. So I spent many years in the metering space, which seems like a really boring, simple, dull, plug this thing on the wall, it turns around and the dials go around. But when you look at it from a systems perspective, then it's actually quite complicated because you gotta get the data, you gotta get it from one system into another, you gotta do various calculations, you gotta do all that stuff. So the good news on this front, so in order to, to, to realize the benefits of these programs, you need accurate metering. And the, of course the most cost effective way to do that is do it in the charger. The technology actually is pretty easy. It's the systems again. How do you ensure it's accurate? How, what format do you deliver it in? Who do you deliver it to? What calculations do they do with it? Um, and the good news there is that there is, uh, uh, this kind of falls into the weights and measures category. Again, really boring stuff, but the world doesn't work without it, right? I mean, if, if you don't know you're getting a gallon of gas when you buy a gallon of gas, you're, you know, um, so this, uh, there's this handbook 44, which the National Institute of Standards and Technology puts out every year, and it has finally, it finally adopted permanent standards for EV chargers. Now each state can follow that or not, and they do, but it's going to take a couple of years state by state as they adopt that standard. But uh, the bottom line is that you get a harmonization because it's a national program. All the manufacturers are gonna meet the standard. Every charger in every home and every business is gonna meet that. And then you can take the next step and we're gonna overlay these programs on top of it and we're gonna pay you for your res demand response or whatever. Yeah, just wanna add a comment. So I just noticed it, you are referring to language that speaks about EV chargers and, and getting them or integrating them as part of the ecosystem. I just wanna, I think maybe it's our job to make sure that mobile energy storage is part of that as well, specifically when it comes to spark charges, um, mobile DC fast chargers, just because yet we, yes, we're gonna um, alleviate some of the pain points from the user, but we can also alleviate when the batteries are not in use, pain points on the utility and grid. And the benefit of us is we can mobilize that as needed, um, yeah, and, and sort of attack certain problematic areas with, with the energy storage as well, so. Yeah, I'm gonna jump on that. So energy storage with EV charging. Right now, we're, we're putting in chargers and they require upgrades to the grid. And in a lot of cases, you could actually avoid 50, 60% of that upgrade by putting in it in storage. So part of what we're doing and advocating with regulators, you look at the total cost picture and make sure your incentives account for that. So that don't just give the money for chargers, but look at the whole picture from interconnection through chargers and whether storage, and that gets back to reliability too, because if you have a battery on site and the grid goes down or whatever, um, you can get more benefits. So we're trying to get them to take this more holistic view in granting the, the financial incentives. Absolutely, all, all really, really great points. And, and we're talking about operationalizing electric vehicles and electric vehicle charging demand and, and vehicle to grid and pushing back onto the grid. And, and there's also different parts of that conversation when you're trying to integrate or communicate with the vehicle versus the actual charging station. And that's that. I think that's part of the the system that, that everyone's trying to figure out, especially electric utilities trying to figure out, well, I've traditionally communicated with an asset that is not mobile. Now, all of a sudden, this asset can be a load or a generator, and it can exist in different points of my network grid at different times. And, and so, you know, Silky, you start talking about open ADR, open AD, and in terms of open automated demand response as a protocol for a utility to communicate to a 
um, essentially all the way down to the electric vehicle to be able to operationalize that. But there's other standards that are emerging. We talked about yesterday, you, you, you brought up open smart charging protocol. And so this, whether it's open ADR or OSCP or uh, 2030.5, right? There's all of these different protocols and standards that are out there right now, and I imagine will continue to evolve. Um, the deeper that we get into the technical aspects of just how much control do you want? How granular do you want? Do you want to set a state of charge? Do you want to send a specific power reduction element? And the, and the, and the, the balance and measures is really important, right? And that, that ties back into this discussion of protocols and standards because how frequently are you taking a power measurement and where, where is that being sent back and how often, what interval, and can you trust the data? At what um, accuracy is that data? So all, all really, really great points. I really appreciate the insights. Um, so with regards to open standards and the discussion of uptime of chargers, what role do open standards and protocols play in the, the very, very important realm of uptime and operations of these electric vehicle chargers? I guess to me, a very crucial point is standardized data sharing and data analytics. So um, I really think that a standardized data sharing between different uh, databases can help um, not only locating chargers, but also uh, addressing if the charger is operable, functional, and uh, as an operator, on the other hand, you're able to read out the data to drive value for the driver, for you as the operator yourself, be able to perform uh, predictive analytics in terms of maintenance to drive cost-effective maintenance. You want to try to get the log, um, the error logs in order to estimate what kind of errors happening at my charger, right? Is it something I have to send out somebody who is $200 an hour or is somebody who is maybe $20 an hour? Is this an error that has to be immediately um, taken care of, or is it okay maybe by tomorrow because it's just the light at the charger that's not properly functioning? So I really like the idea about uh, standardized data sharing between different networks, which is also a consequence of standardizing the communication between backends. Yeah, and this is another area, the, the recent development with the NEVI standards. Right, so this is not theoretical anymore. Under NEVI, every charge point operator has to provide data in real time via an open API on the status of the charger, the availability of the star charger, the price, the uh, type of charger, and that has to be open to everybody. So app developers can bring that in, Google Maps could bring that in, show it on Google Maps. So that's designed primarily for the driver. So I'm driving down the road and I can see where I can go charge and how much it's gonna cost. But from a reliability perspective, it does two things. First of all, it, that data is now available to service providers in real time. So they can see as soon as the charger goes down, they can see that it's down. But that's the other point, is right now you have a lot of chargers that go down. I've, you see these stories in the press. The charger was down last week, I checked it again, it's still down this week. Etc. So it's really going to help with reliability. Yeah, just to add on, I think the open standard will minimize the troubleshooting time. So standardization of the error codes, I think, will also help us standardize the workforce that we're going to build in order to address the errors that will occur across many different pieces of hardware. Um, and in doing so, allow us to deploy the right people in a much uh, faster fashion and thereby increase uptime. Or also maybe uh, one more comment on interoperability. If you are a charge point operator and you would run out of business, for example, you don't end up with you know, 500 ghosted stranded assets on a parking lot, but you have the availability to capability of another operator taking over those charging stations. So that is something what I really also appreciate, appreciate about interoperability within the ecosystem. Thank you, thank you. And I, I, th I like that point about the workforce. I think that's really important because, you know, it, it all um, ties back into um, this industry, how to build it up, and the customer experience, right? If, if things are standardized and you have a station that's down, and say you have a 
number on that charging station, you call for support. How can you train that workforce, that support agent, to walk you through a set of troubleshooting steps when there are infinite number of troubleshooting steps given the different charging stations that are out there, the different kinds of vehicles and the ways that they operate and interconnect? All, all really great points. What role do you see that electric utilities have with regards to standards and protocols um, with regards to electric vehicles? Do you think that they should be adding additional requirements for interconnection or integration to help drive the market, or should they not get involved? Well, they're fundamentally involved, right? I mean, you can't, they have to connect to the, the, the site. So uh, a couple points there. First of all, you have these rebate programs that utilities have for chargers. I mean, those absolutely should only provide for network chargers. Uh, maybe some who disagree here, but... The, the advantages of networking way out uh, way outweigh the uh, the cost of adding networking to chargers. Um, another is that those chargers should be standardized. So, for example, that network interface should be an OCPP interface. So, if their uh, software provider decides to go out of business, or they decide they don't like their software provider anymore, they can switch that out and it doesn't cost them anything and they can keep the charter. So the utilities can have a, a huge role in, in simply enforcing, if you will, standards. And it's not a mandate. Nobody has to do it. If you want the rebate, you have to do it. But you, you, know, you don't have to participate in the program. So it's, a, it's purely voluntary. And then on, on the inter, interconnection side, just uh, there's some clarification and some simplification. Um, that's a challenging area because Every site is different, and so interconnection works a little bit differently. But, but there's some basic areas that need to be addressed. One is you know, putting power back on the grid from a battery. You know, that most, I don't know, maybe all utilities won't allow that at this point uh, in their interconnection standards in this example, but there are other ones as well. Thank you, thank you. So how do open standards enhance system management interoperability? So um, I think that is all, this is the whole point of open standards, right? I think the whole point of open standards is backend systems interoperability. And um, depending on what kind of connection you're looking at, hardware to backend, such as charger to backend or backend to backend within cross functions, there are different standards. OCPP is uh, the dominant uh, protocol for charger to backend communication. Um, then you will have, uh, we just talked about it, Open ADR, for example, for the backends between energy ecosystems. And then there's this whole e roaming side, right, where you have like hub roaming, bilateral roaming possibilities coming with their respective protocols. So I think the whole point of this landscape of open standardization protocols between, you know, multiple players is harmonizing and managing backend systems interoperability and systems management. Go ahead. Okay, uh, I'm going to come back to reliability. And how many of you have seen this, the San Francisco Bay Area study, the 72% study, where they went out and checked all the public chargers and only 72% of them worked? Now, if you look at the details underneath that study, about 6% of the time the charger wasn't working. The other, the 20, 2% of the time, it was the systems were not talking to each other. The car wasn't talking to the charger, the charger wasn't talking to the payment system or something else. And that's where the systems comes in, is those interfaces need to work all the time. All of them need to be working in order for you to be able to plug that in, make it work and get to have ultimately that Tesla experience that we're looking for. Yeah, I think when I think about interoperability and how these standards sort of facilitate that, I think of a hybrid um, mobile charger, fixed charger solution. What if that is the best thing in the end for, let's say, a, a fleet company, right? Um, some, in some locations, they need um, fixed infrastructure. In others, maybe they don't have access to you know, the utility power needed there. And 
they want mobile, but they want to, uh, you know, be able to control that and um, view the, the systems using the same platform. So that is what an open standard will facilitate, hybrid service models that best fit the application. Thank you. Chris, you, you talked a little bit about the, these different systems and, and what the San Francisco study. Now, how far are we from being able to find a way for all of these systems, ecosystems, different ecosystems, to be able to communicate and talk together cohesively and efficiently and in a time frame that um, makes sense where you, you don't have someone stranded for a certain amount of time trying to pay at the charging station because it's not connected. How, how far away do you think we are from seeing that work in a cohesive manner? Well, having been in this space for as long as I have, it, it's a continuous effort, uh, continuous improvement. Now, I'm going to come back to Nevi again, um, and the, just to your point about, well, if it's not working, can I pay for it? They, one of the, so the requirements is an 800 number that you can you can pay for it, but, but what it really comes down to is breaking down these walls, these barriers that the uh, charging network companies have put up. Tesla has put up their walls with their proprietary technology, and the, uh, these companies don't like to share data, for example. They don't want to put out the real-time data. A few of them do, but they all will have to to get these NEVI funds. It'll become an expectation of EV drivers, and so they're going to have to open up their networks. Uh, they have to open up on payment. Right now, you have to get a different RFID card for each network and sign up on their app to use their network. There's a little bit of roaming, but not very much. So these, uh, some top-down pushing, and then there's going to be a lot more consumer uh, pushing from the bottom up. Because one of the things we've got, and, and we all know the technology adoption curve, and we're still in the early adopters, right, the, the innovators, and we're not into the early majority. But as we get into the early majority, they're going to say, I'm not going to carry six RFID cards. You know, I just want to swipe my credit card or have one membership cover, cover all of it. So I'm going to push. I'm only going to use providers, to, you know, who are open. Um, so just coming back to the crystal ball, in three years, I, I think we're going to see a completely transformed environment uh, because of really this national leadership that we've got now. What can the brilliant minds and folks in this room here today do to help push standards, protocols, standardizing this industry, and, and how, what kind of call to action do you have for them to, to get involved in this very, very important topic? I mean, there are uh, global consortia that are open, so uh, the Open Charge Alliance, for example, or the ISO. So there is like standardization efforts um, in the whole industry, and uh, they look for members, they look for drivers, um, and everybody is invited, you know, to participate. This is why they're open. This is why they're not proprietary, because that's exactly the goal of open standards, that everybody is involved, and also, um, helps driving the quality of open standards because what can be better than such a broad application base used by everybody and help you know also constantly improving it adapting it to needs to to weak points like we said earlier there's still room for interpretation sometimes on the development side and the more people are really facilitating open communication protocols industry experts users um, the better yeah so I guess everybody is uh, welcome to join. I want to echo that. Attending the consortium like test events and making your equipment, whether that's an EVSC or an EV or a test, uh, a tester, a piece of test equipment accessible and available, especially as a startup, by the way, it's been so hard to get access to some of this equipment because it sometimes it's just cost prohibitive. Sometimes, you know, we're the small fish and the company doesn't want, want to provide the access. But being a little bit more flexible, attending these events, will that they've easily been the, the most um, beneficial events to us as a smaller company and helped us really kind of launch off. So, yeah, active participation for sure. Yeah, so, that, so if you're a manufacturer, like you said, to make sure your equipment works with 
different software if you're a charger manufacturer, if you're a software provider, make sure it works with different chargers. Uh, if, if you're a customer, you're making sure that you're the same thing when I buy the software, the hardware, that it's interoperable. Or if I'm an EV driver, even, you know, it's a little bit tougher because you're going to do the, what's most convenient generally, right? But to the, you know, complain to your network provider or say, you know, why can't I use, you know, my card with this other network kind of thing. But, but to, there are personal actions that each one of us can take uh, on this. Thank you. I'd like to open it up now for questions from the audience. I don't know about you guys, but I'm, I'm, I'm really excited. I've been really excited about um, this topic of, of protocols and standards and really excited to be involved. Go ahead. Hello, my name is Salim. I'm from QuickEP. We are a software uh, company. I have a question regarding the, the um, event that you mentioned for the quality or testing uh, event. Um, do you send that, that, that feedback for troubleshooting errors for the o OCA or the ISO by, by the end of this event? Because I know the OCA, they have like a couple of um, lab for testing out the charger with the software. Uh, as a software engineer, we always see this issue and we are relying on the OCA to, to see what is that debugging step that we have to do or all this stuff. So I just want to have a career stay about how you how you sending the yeah. feedback and how you sharing the debugging results. Thank I you. I think that's that's an excellent point. Ooh. Now that you say that, I think that's actually a really excellent point. I think that's probably a missing step um, where that information kind of stays between the EVSC and the EV and doesn't make its way back into the standard or people kind of uh, facilitating standard, you know, development. So we need, to, we need to do that and figure out a way so that there's feedback. Mm -hmm. Question right here in the front. Hello. Yes. Uh, good, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for uh, the discussions. I'm not very sophisticated in terms of software. That's. Uh, I work on software long ago, <laughs> decades ago, but I've also worked in the standardization. So going back to basics, the word open standards really, for me, is uh, contradictory. And maybe that's the reason why it takes some time for uh, the whole system to converge. If there are so many discrepancies, interpretation, maybe it's okay to be more humble and accept a more narrow standard. That's actually how we build standard in the automotive. Uh, I, I used to be part of Europe back uh, some time ago. Standard is very strict. Mm -hmm. But the concept of open bothers me. I, uh, maybe I'm too old to, to understand that that's possible, but I also see that uh, Maybe to accept openness, that has to be within the framework of what is known. Therefore, artificial intelligence could help. Okay, that's did, did you guys get that? Would you like me to re re summarize? I'll try to summarize. Not sure a what bit. the question is. So I think the question is around, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the question is around the the concept of, and framing of open with regards to open standards and um, how that kind of plays into some of the broader interpretations versus having a narrower interpretation or narrow definition around a standard. Um, so I think it's maybe this definition around open and what open means with regards to the standards and broad versus narrow. Is it, did I capture that correctly? Thank you. So I would say the standard is the document that outlines the specific elements of the protocol. It's what makes it open is the process. Openness is a process. It's 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 uh, manufacturers testing with different uh, software providers. That pr business process of working together, publishing how you have implemented the standard, uh, having third parties who can do testing of 
of implementation of the standard and those sorts of things? I think that maybe some of the conf our confusion or maybe lack of optimization that maybe is associated with an open standard can be solved primarily with establishing who the stakeholder who the stakeholders are and what their role is who owns what in the process um, because I know that there there is still a lot of confusion on that and there and that causes maybe a lack of movement or forward movement with the standard that that's my take on that yeah I guess um, and open just means basically sharing the knowledge right within the protocol it does not mean like interpretable or not accurate I think um, everybody is very keen on making as precise as possible and also minimize the room for interpretation it is just because it's not proprietary and you have really lots of different interfaces different players um, there is just more effort to harmonize this but I don't think open means um, you know less accurate. It's just more effort to fine tune it and optimize it to a broad um, application of systems. So um, to me, open is really just not the contrast of proprietary shared knowledge, and I think this is very important. Also, especially as you mentioned, um, when you're a smaller company, right, you're able to participate in the game. You're not dependent on being like a big player already that can help shape the EV infrastructure. You can be a part of uh, the whole transition. So that is my take on that question. Thank you. Uh, talking about standards, there's, uh, there's protocols and there's work being done around uh, software, the, uh, the hardware uh, manufacturing, uh, but what about uh, operations and maintenance, like uh, the, the actual life uh, of, like once you install it, someone has to live with it and, and uh, make sure it's working and working properly and there is some expectations that need to set. Uptime is a very fluid term in some cases, so what standards or what, uh, what guidelines can be used to actually make sure it's done properly? Well, we had the NEVI 97% uh, requirement, of course. Um, this is, uh, we're still in our infancy as an industry, right? I mean, even though 10 years or so we've been around. So people are developing some of, the, some of these standardized procedures and operations and maintenance and you know how often do you do preventive maintenance and so on. So that is uh, developing, I, I would call those business process standards to get the reliability up. And uh, the good thing about the, you know, the federal requirement is that as an industry, we're being forced to find ways to do that. And, and then the market will sort that out. Some companies will do better than others and they'll get more business and so on. I agree completely on that, yeah. So do I. On, you said on the safety front, you're asking about the safety front follow-up? There's a UL certification, right? Um, okay, right over here. I'm curious, do you think that the forums that you're able to uh, create and its standards and protocols for this industry, are those current forums enough? Is there a, a need for a, a charging forum in particular? Um, or, in, in if, or are there good forums that you're already participating in that you think more people need to be a part of? We are, thank you for that question. We, um, we are trying to start, well, not we're trying, we, we are working on starting a forum on 15.11.8 because, again, back to Nevi, it says that uh, all the chargers have to be capable of implementing 15.11.8. Now, what does that mean in practice? Well, you've got the charger manufacturer, you've got the software provider, you've got the vehicle OEM is involved, and then you've got the payment system. So somebody has to convene those four groups of stakeholders. Um, we think Charin might be a good one to do that. But somebody has to do that and get those people talking to each other because all of those 
systems that needed to talk to each other to achieve that plug and charge, which Tesla does today. But um, that's a, a, a forum that's emerging. All right, so, right sorry, here. I had to figure out how to turn the microphone on. No, that's fine. Uh, <laughs> technical conversation, I can't figure that out. Um, we've kind of alluded to it uh, in a couple of different respects with you know, the government intervention through Nevi and, and then with kind of the businesses themselves and the industry kind of finding its own way. And we've talked about standards in all sorts of different industries. Uh, the one that pops to my head is USB-C versus lightning cables, right? Um, do you think it would be more beneficial um, for this, the agreed upon standard or the agreed upon protocol to be more pushed from government interaction or to be more solved by the industry itself to find the correct, the best case scenario? And if, if the best case scenario is multiple standards, is, is that something that, that you see would work as well? I think uh, the development of standards is rather market driven than a top down regulated decision. And I think that is also what I would uh, vote for because it's, um, the stakeholders, the players off the game need to decide what's the best solution. And it's very hard to foresee on uh, you know, 10, 15 years from now how the technology will look like. And the technology will look like on what's optimal for us, right? And so I think the development of standards is something that should, should grow as we go, but we should streamline it into the right direction and make sure that it grows on the right direction and in one direction. And as you mentioned, too many standards, maybe trying to solve the same challenge might also not be ideal. So there's a huge uh, desire to communicate. And I think such an event like today in the forum like this is truly helpful because transparency and communication within the industry is number one to make this successful. Because if we worked in silos, um, I don't think this would be any beneficial. So I believe uh, market dynamics and market-driven standardization is uh, future-proof. Thank you. Right over here. Hi, my name is Hugo. I work for uh, Ecogy. Um, there are three points I really liked uh, what you said about. So the, we are all working in silos. This is uh, exactly true. Um, I like that you mentioned the San Francisco study because 72% uptime is for us really low. Uh, and I also like what you said about, let's say, transferring the knowledge after the festivals that we are all running through. So we operate and we maintain uh, on a daily basis 10,000 level 3 DC chargers with 98% uh, uptime, mostly in Europe. And we understand the complexity which is behind it. Uh, we are a member of Charin. We participate to the establishment of standards, the S1598-2-20. And I would like to just uh, call for everyone who wants to cooperate with us that we are able and we want to share this knowledge because, of course, we all want to make, let's say, you know, our company successful and money and stuff like that. But in the end, we are all working towards the same challenge. I think it's really the range anxiety. We want to get rid of that. And I think we want, as a user, when we come to uh, a charging station, to be successful, successful and not have, let's say, one chance out of four to fail. Yeah? So I'm just calling here, if you want to cooperate with us, uh, we are here, we are open, and uh, we will be pleased to, to talk to you guys. Thank you, Andy. Come, and come back to this the question over Go here. Um, and, and, and I agree, in, in a lot of cases, the market will develop and should develop this standard. Um, I think one way to think about it is kind of the, uh, maybe from an expectations or even from a power relationship sort of thing. If I, as a consumer, go and you know, buy electricity from a charger, I expect it to be accurate. But I, as a consumer, have no power to drive a standard there. So that's where the government comes in and says it's got to be accurate. Um, where government, our, our position has been on some of these standards, where government money is, where public money is provided, it's a ratepayer government, then it's appropriate for the funding to include a requirement for a standard. Uh, if, if Tesla wants to build their charger network, then I, the government shouldn't step in and tell them what to do because they're spending their own money. So we kind of balance it, you know, where's the funding coming from and where, where's the power relationship? And this gets to the reliability thing too because if I'm a consumer and I drive up to a station, I, I expect it to work. Um, California has mandating in a law 
97% uptime for all public chargers. So that it's whether it's privately or publicly funded, and that gets back to that expectation sort of thing. So it's, I think it's kind of a nuanced uh, approach. Thank you, right here in the back. Hello, my name is Rick Jennings. I work for a company called Sky Foundry. And in my experience, it's very challenging to integrate EV chargers into the built environment. Uh, there's different protocols that the smart buildings industry is using, such as, you know, BACnet, Modbus, et cetera. And most of the EVSE manufacturers just don't support these standards. They support OCPP. And I don't see that changing, frankly. Uh, but I'm wondering, what, how do you see, what standards do you see that are, is going to allow this exchange of data between the EV chargers and building automation systems? And how are we going to do this on-premise? Because often it's required for cybersecurity reasons or for load management. I'd love to hear your take on this. So I, I think we're the only ones, but we do have a Modbus charger. We do too. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, the two of us then. So, so I, as the, the uh, desire in the market for that go, goes up, uh, more of us will implement that. It's not a huge deal to implement into a charger. The, the other way is just through back-end systems. So you go OCPP to one back-end system that then talks to the building management system. Yeah, and I think there's, there's a, a lot of work that's going on with that, with some of the, the funding that's out there. You have connected communities that are really trying to bring together building, electrified buildings, electrified transportation. You have a couple of different grants going on, but that's definitely going to be um, what is happening and, and where the industry is going with regards to just electric load and being able to control it, both for vehicles and buildings. They're going to come together a lot more. So I'm going to do a, a la Sorry, go ahead. All right, so if a charger supports both OCPP and Modbus, how do you do contention resolution? They're just providing information to different systems. So, I mean, you're saying, okay, so via OCPP, I might tell the charger to shut off and the building management might tell it to shut, turn on kind of thing. I mean, that would just be in the firmware. And, All right, any other questions? All right, I'm gonna do a last poll. Who, just because I'm curious, frankly, uh, who here is driving an EV? Interesting, okay. Who here took an EV to get to the Mirage? Three, about three people in the room. <laughs> who here, or four, has seen the charging stations in the Mirage parking lot? And who has had the great opportunity to actually use them? Wow, you guys are the ones taking up the parking spots I've been trying to use. <laughs> All right. Well, um, thank you so much for participating and staying to the very end. This was the last session. Um, it's really, really been great. It's been a wonderful conversation. Thank you to all the panelists and to EV Charging Summit and Expo as a whole. Um, I hope you enjoy your stay here in Las Vegas and you enjoy the rest of your afternoon. And hopefully you had a chance to extend and, and enjoy some of the wonderful amenities here. Thank you. Have a great day. <laughs>